welcome to our time. Craig Wilkins has worked in the areas of public health, social services, environmental change and politics for the past about 30 years in a variety of not-for-profit and government organisations as well as in Parliament House. That'll be interesting to find out about. He's a passionate believer in collective altruism, which is the act of people generously working together on behalf of others and the planet we all call home. Welcome, Craig. Thanks, Malcolm. Great to be here. We've been trying to do this for six months, <laughs> at least. Have. Yes. Because you're always jetting off to talk to them in Parliament, I think, <laughs> in Canberra or somewhere as exotic. Yeah, usually travelling for work um, and working a lot in the eastern states at the moment. Mm. With a new job that we're mm. going to talk about because it's fascinating mm. what you're now taking on. Mm. <gasps> Goodness, <laughs> lucky you is all I can say. But somebody that is interested in, in the environment, mm. as we all are to a degree, mm. but often we're not as interested as we probably need to be in mm. the simple things of what we do at home. Yeah, it's true, and that's where it certainly should start. And where I'm thinking back, that's where I kind of got my guidance from, from my parents, actually, who were fantastic recyclers, and we had a rainwater tank at home, and they always Me looked too. after the you know the water, and just that that awareness about the importance of of being frugal, responsible, and, and wise around our resources. And those lessons, I think, are, are essential for everyone. Becoming more and more important. For what it's worth, my parents were. A uh, young married couple mm. during the depression years, mm. and so they were very used to recycling and reusing absolutely everything. Yes, my dad used to collect screws and mm. all sorts of things yeah. because you never knew when you were going to need them. Yeah, and sadly, I'm the same, and we end up hoarding maybe too much <laughs> for exactly that. Yes, it can spill into mental health issues it, it very can. quickly. But, but just being careful with things is, is an yeah. essential part of, I suppose, that responsible relationship to the planet. But also we're inclined to chuck everything too mm. quickly, mm. like clothing and mm. electrical equipment. You can't mm. get things fixed anymore. Yes. yes. Are the, are, do those sorts of attitudes to the general public bother you? Well, it's, uh, I think we as humans, we're influenced hugely by the system we're in. And, and the system is designed in this linear way where things are, are, are created and then used and then disposed of. And, and mm. so to, to fight against that um, is actually quite challenging. But there are lots of opportunities. In fact, uh, my partner and I have just recently discovered uh, the Unley Repair Cafe, which is a fantastic service. Um, you can take your electronic goods or clothing or other things there and then these wonderful volunteers then repair things oh really um, and and then you that's give, an give it here in south australia yeah yeah in the clarence park community center and oh, there's, okay. there's about i think there's at least a dozen repair cafes across the adelaide metro area and you know, across i never the state. knew that it, it's fantastic i have to get service. them on the show yes yeah i think you should tell me more <laughs> tell me more but craig with your mm. life mm. Uh, how did you get into really mm. the political area mm. or advising politicians because you just just explain a few mm. of the things and people or things is the wrong word parties mm. and people mm. that you've been an advisor to yeah so i um I, oh, actually mm. before you answer that because mm. you didn't know what you were going to do did mm. you until you went to uni no i i grew up in the country came to the city and uh, i was actually studying economics and was really struggling with that because it just didn't seem to make sense in terms of how the real world worked. It was all these theories and, and frameworks which just didn't match up to what I was seeing and feeling. So I dropped out of that and uh, um, wasn't quite sure what to do and actually ended up doing nursing for, for a few years because I thought I'd go overseas and do voluntary work and try and make a difference that way. But in the meantime, I actually uh, stumbled across um, uh, Bob Brown talking, um, the mm -hmm. ex-senator from Tasmania, yep. um, wonderful environmentalist. And, and he was talking... Quite influential. Hugely in influential. Um, and he was talking about the Tasmanian forests and talking about it in a way which was just so inspiring. It, was, it wasn't just about the majestic eagles and, the, and the, these amazing trees which have been around for hundreds of years and the, the complexity of the forest, but it was also around the, the bizarre economics of the forest industry where we were essentially paying to have these trees cut down with, with no return to the public. And I was just so surprised about, about that. And so... Um, 
I got more interested in, in what he was saying and uh, more in, interested in the Tasmanian forest issues. And I realised that, that actually this was something that I cared passionately about. And, and from there, I got more and more into environmental politics. And um, uh, I, I was fortunate I was actually able to work in the public service in South Australia for the environmental um, department uh, in what was called the Office of Sustainability and doing mm -hmm. things like um, community gardens and farmers markets and, and cycling. And um, so I was able to really learn a lot around how to make policy and, 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 uh, and actions happen across the public service. But there are simple things that people can do, mm. like have a garden at home, which mm. is getting harder and harder with smaller and smaller blocks or you know, units being jammed together yeah, yeah. or high rise. Yep. But everyone can have a garden. Yeah, I mean, and if you haven't got room at home, even if it's just a, a few pots, there mm. are community gardens that you can you can join, um, or else um, planting things on roadside verges. Uh, a lot of councils allow that. Yes, so that, but the thing is, it's putting oxygen back into our breathable mm. air. Yeah, absolutely. And we're not thinking about that enough. Well, at, at the moment, we're actually cutting down a huge number of our beautiful big old trees across um, the Adelaide city. And, um, and, and that's a deep concern as well, because they are the air conditioners of our city. They are the, the oxygen creators mm. of our cities. They keep us cooler and happier and healthier. And so looking after our trees is an essential part of our, our role as, as a citizen. But, but it's mm. not just trees. It's all plants. Mm. It can be anything. Yeah, it yeah. can be the pot plant. Yeah. My house is full of plants, yeah. <laughs> um, which can cause a bit of a problem. But, but at the same time, it's life around us. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's nothing like green. Absolutely. And in fact, there's a whole concept called um, the, the National Park City. So thinking of Adelaide as a whole national park, which means that every bit of the parklands, every roadside verge, every pot plant on, on a balcony actually contributes to what we, we feel and, and, and connect with in terms mm. of nature because, you know, bees use you know, oh, of course. Um, the flowers in a pot plant to, to, yes. to pollinate. So. And where would we be without the bees? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that's the big concern yeah. at the moment, isn't mm. it, with the, this bee... Um, virus that's spreading. Yeah, we, 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 as, as humans, we're kind of stretching more and more into um, into nature, giving less and less space to nature. And uh, in many places, the nature is struggling. And, and that's a good example where you've got um, uh, uh, native bees who are being um, uh, having less and less sort of habitat to, to, to live in, um, getting squeezed out, and, and yet they provide such an important service. Um, well, just recently on the show, Christian Messenger was here. Ah, brilliant. Uh, okay. Great communicator. <laughs> Talking about we were saying that we, you know, I, th I was saying I think that humans are sort of the top of the the top of the development of, of life. And mm. she said, no, no, no. It's the other way around. It's the grubs. <laughs> it's the bugs and slugs yeah. that do all the work and keep it all going. Yeah. And when you actually put that into perspective, it changes everything yeah. when you think about it. There is such an intricate relationship we have with everything around us. and But we keep on forgetting. We kind of turn on a tap and water appears or we turn on a switch and, and lights turn on. And yet behind that is this amazingly complex system mm. and all these incredible services that nature gives us. Mm. Mm. Oh, and that we give us too, but it mm. takes from nature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned the rainwater tank. Mm. I was brought up in the Adelaide Hills, mm. so rainwater mm. tanks were all we had. Yep, yep. Um, the bucket in the toilet was all we had, and mm. we had fabulous uh, uh, apple trees mm. <laughs> because of all of that. Mm. And I often think um, if you go down that path of knowing where all the sewerage goes yeah. and what happens to that, yeah. and what that's turned into yeah. and the benefit that that could be from a waste product. Absolutely. But I don't know how many people are actually even conscious mm. of that or what you can do with waste. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole concept of you know, circularity in terms of our, of our impact. Um, and you may have heard of the term the circular economy, this idea mm. of, the, of different um, industries being able to use the waste products of others to, to, uh, as, as feed source for theirs rather than this linear path. And the same thing with, with ourselves as, 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 as households. How do we um, try and um, make that circular activity as, as tight as possible and to stop that spilling out in, in, into the world around us. So with governments, mm. this is what they're literally getting you to say, mm. this is what we should do. Is mm. that where you fit in yeah. or where you have 
where you've been fitting in up until recently. Yeah, certainly. So for, for um, a decade, I was the head of uh, South Australia's peak environment body, the Conservation Council of South Australia. And so in that role, um, I did a lot of different um, um, work in areas like the circular economy and, and waste management, um, the energy system, because we've got an incredible story to tell here in South Australia about our renewable energy, the wind and solar, wow. um, about our, our water, um, well, transport, well, all these different areas. Th th this is one of the things that there is getting a bit of flack about mm. now with mm. the uh, with with the new form of making energy. Mm. Are we on the right path, do you think, mm. with this? With the solar panels, with the wind turbines, yeah. um, talking about the same thing happening in the ocean, mm. but then people complaining because we might have power lines going through where we don't want them. Yeah. How, how do you cope with that? Yeah, th th there's, a, there's a whole lot of trade-offs around our energy system. I mean, at the moment, um, in South Australia, we've done this incredible journey around wind and solar. So we went, 20 years ago, we had hardly any um, in, our, in, our, in our grid. Now we have um, around 70 to 75%, heading towards 100% within two or three years. And we actually lead the world. Um, with probably up there with, with, with Denmark, in terms of, of the level of, of wind and solar in our grid. Um, and, and to have a, a gigawatt scale economy surviving on um, you know, energy from the wind and the sun is quite extraordinary. It is globally significant. And, and so at the moment, we're doing a lot of work around the firming it up so to enable when the wind doesn't um, uh, blow right. or the sun doesn't shine, making sure there's power. And there's right. a whole range of options there. We're also connected into a national grid. And so, you know, perhaps if it's not blowing wind here, it's blowing wind elsewhere. Right. But the overall impact is, is, is that we have far less um, um, carbon and far less um, um, in environmental impact for our energy use. And it's also cheaper over time because um, once it's all set up and running, we then um, actually get, get the, 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 the sun you know, shines for free. And, um, and the, 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 the key challenge for us here in South Australia is to make sure those benefits of, of, of a transformation are passed down to households and we integrate with our transport and do all these, all these other wonderful things to keep um, pushing ahead and being that world leader we are now. It, it actually is a really exciting story to tell. It is. Mm. And you've got another very exciting story to tell, which we'll come back and do in just a moment. Welcome back to our time. Craig Wilkins is our very special guest. Craig, you've got a new position mm. in Australia mm. that is extraordinarily important and could save the lives of many things mm. if you can make it happen. hope so. Nothing simple, nothing <laughs> yeah. easy with no that. No pressure. No pressure whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Just explain, the new position is... I am uh, just started as the National Director of the Murray-Darling Conservation Alliance. So, so Which means? Yes, it, it's, a, it's a new alliance of uh, environmental groups, uh, in fact, the peak bodies of the, the Murray-Darling Basin states, so that's South Australia, Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales. And uh, Pretty amazing mm. that a river mm. uh, literally takes mm. from others, but... Mm literally runs so far. Yeah, the, the basin is a, is, is a huge part of, of Australia. and It's, it's, it's um, not the largest in the world, is it? But it's no, second or not, third. Not or... in size. Um, and in terms of water volume, um, it, it, it isn't um, up there at all compared with the Amazon or the Mississippi or others like that. Mm, right. But in terms of the critical importance to, to oh. Australia, it is, is absolutely essential. We'd be a bit thirsty here in this state without it. As the driest state and the driest continent. So, and right at the end of the river, we, we mm. so rely on on a healthy Murray-Darling Basin. So, so we um, all need to put in tanks to start with. <laughs> well, that, that's, Rainwater that's tanks. It's a simple contribution which, which makes a difference because Adelaide relies heavily on, on the river mm. as well as um, the Clare Valley and the Barossa Valley and uh, mm. lots of, uh, of our industry. Which is a long way away from the river. Uh, there are pipes snaking all over South I Australia. Know. Yeah, transporting that water. Um, and um, you know, th th there's been some really challenging times. Uh, people can, I'm sure, remember the millenni millennium drought, uh, which was only just over you know, 10, 12 years ago, mm. um, where the river was in deep, deep trouble. And uh, we desperately want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. To, we want to build up the resilience of the river and make sure that there's, there's enough water flowing down to, to, to is, keep is, it healthy. Is the real yeah. reason because so much water has been taken by growers upstream? Mm. Or is 
or is it just that because we are mm. in the driest country, mm. our rainfall has changed? Mm. Um, it's uh, a little bit of a combination of both, but but mostly the, the first. We essentially, as, as Australians, we do take out too much water from the system for its general health. And that, that's been a historic thing over 100 years. We've kind of gradually taken more and more water away. And part of the, the process at the moment is trying to re return some of that water and make sure it does flow all the way down and then spilling over into the wetlands and the billabongs and all those incredibly important you know, kidneys and, and mm. liver and lungs of, of the river to, to mm. keep it healthy and making sure are, there's are enough not, water. Are we not... Mm catching enough water. Mm. I mean, there's rainfall. We've recently mm. had a lot of rainfall, mm. particularly on the eastern side of the country. Mm. Are we not... Mm. Do we not have enough facilities to capture that water? It's not the, Sorry, yeah. before you answer that... Sure. And, and mm. also, obviously, not for, um, for growers of grain and food that we need, but... Mm. 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 Is there a need to bring back the old rainwater tank in mm. new development everywhere? Mm. Um, well, I can answer the, the first, uh, the, the last bit first. Definitely, uh, rainwater tanks are incredibly important as much for the water capture as to uh, retard um, stormwater when it falls onto our roofs from, um, from, from rainfall mm. and before it flows out to the streets and then, then out um, and eventually, uh, unfortunately, a lot of it flows out um, to, to, the to, to the ocean mm. where it actually does a lot of damage to our seagrasses. Mm. So if a rainwater tanks can actually slow down that, that, that peak rush of water, that um, reduces the flooding risk. Um, because there are yeah. filters and things mm. to filter the water to be drinkable. Yeah, yeah. And let's face it, we're drinking water that's filtered from the river anyway. Absolutely. No, um, yeah, it, it is. And South Australia traditionally has been really familiar with, with using rainwater for, for, for general household use, and we need to again. But, but yeah, further upstream, it's actually probably less around trying to capture water uh, than allow the water to flow naturally across floodplains and then arrive into the river channel right. and then, then flow. So what's happened over, over decades... But, but, but keeping the water sort of where it is? Mm. Is it bigger dams? Is mm. it something like that before it flows or yeah. would that then damage? Well, the, the, we've, uh, throughout the, the, the basin, there are a series of, of, of large, large dams. We don't need any more dams. We don't need any more. Actually, both, the natural lakes, but also, also dams. But you've so, answered that. Yes, Thank you. Yeah, so, so there, there, is, there is probably a, enough you know, dams within the system to, to, to hold critical use for, you know, for humans' amount of water. But what's happening now is, is that across the floodplains, particularly in New South Wales, there's been a whole lot of artificial um, walls created to retard the water and, and keep it for um, upstream irrigation, rather than allowing it to flow into the river and, and then flowing down right. in, into South Australia. Selfish, they're selfish. Well, I mean, it, it's, as, <laughs> it's as ancient uh, as, as any issue where the upstream and downstream water are it's around everywhere. rivers. everywhere. It is, yeah. Everywhere. It's the old line about, um, you know, uh, whiskey is for drinking. Drinking water is for fighting. Like it's, it's, and people upstream and downstream always have a contest over water. But the reality is, unless that water flows down and out to the Murray mouth, um, there's a whole lot of build up of, of silt and organic matter and salt. And over time, the whole river um, degrades and, and we all, all fish struggle. die. All the fish die, which is happening now. And we've got, uh, in, in the last uh, um, um, couple of months, we've, we've had a, uh, some fish kills in, a, in the southern uh, lagoon of the Coorong. As well, you know, within the last 12 months, fish kills in the lower end of the Darling. And we've got mm. a, a, a breakout of blue-green algae in Lake Alexandrina. So all these signs indicate that the whole system is, is, is not healthy. It's, it's losing its resilience. And what we're very concerned about is, is when the next drought comes along, which it will, that's just the nature of Australia, when that comes, this system has to be healthier and more resilient. Otherwise, um, you know, who knows what, what will happen. Before, we, we, were, we were within uh, weeks of having um, bottled water delivered to households yes, in Adelaide. Exactly. It was so desperate. I think maybe everyone yeah. needs to see the Mad Max films to wow. see what could happen. I mean, really, yeah. that's that's what that's all about, isn't yeah, it? Really? Yeah, yeah the, the, the hyper-awareness about the importance of water. Mm. It, it, I mean, water is everything when it comes to the environment and to humans. Of course. Mm. With that, well, we are mostly water. <laughs> it's at true. At the end of the day. <laughs> so what can... What can governments really do mm. to help with this? Mm. I mean, legislate, 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 yep. but it doesn't actually yep. solve the problem yeah. in real terms. Yeah. And like we were saying before, um, yeah. 
the way that I was brought up and the way that you learnt to live as well mm. was to reuse things, the rainwater tanks, yep. Yep. Um, you know, just don't throw everything away, mm. don't need to buy so much. Mm. Mm. What are the answers, yeah. do you think? Well, or is it education? Uh, not, not so much, actually. And, and, and the reason why I say that is, is I've, my, my background was in, was in public health in terms of uh, I did a master's in, in, in primary health care at Flinders Uni. And the essential message I learned from, from that was that um, to, to ensure people remained healthy, you have to make the healthy choices the easy choices. So in, oh, in terms right. of, for yeah. instance, like you can sort of say to someone or you can educate them and say, oh, you, you must take public transport. But unless there's a train or a bus available at the right time, people don't take it. Yep. You have to make it easy for people. In the same way for, for, for the environment, um, you know, if, if it is about energy use, you, you make it as seamless as possible to, 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 to choose greener electricity. You're and that's making... where governments come in. Absolutely. Governments have an essential role to, to make those choices as, as easy as possible. And, it, and, and part of it is, is working with industry, part of it's working with the community, but a lot of it is around the systems, so about, about how, how you connect um, the things we need with, with the, the choices humans make in, in, at a household level. Our current politicians, they obviously, there's a lot of uh, pressure on them to mm. come up with the goods with all of this. Mm. Are they making it, do you think? Um, what I often say to people, because I'm often asked this question, is when it comes to the environment, we're winning, but we're winning slowly. And when it comes to things like climate or the biodiversity crisis, to win slowly is the same as losing. And because unfortunately, the, what's happening, and especially in terms of climate, is, it, is that the changes are happening so rapidly, we're just not keeping up. So even though there's a lot of good things happening, we've got to go faster and harder. And that's really, really the role of our elected leaders and our, our governments to put the foot on the accelerator and go much, much faster, much, much harder, uh, because otherwise we're going to get further and further behind. And unfortunately, you know, Mother Nature doesn't read balance sheets or press no. releases or really she has her own... too much about humans. Not either. at all. She has her own yes. you know, decisions that she makes and, and mm. uh, unless we keep up with her, we're going to be in trouble. Keeping up with everything. Mm. Uh, and we do too. And we'll be back in a <laughs>Craig Wilkins has been our special guest on this episode. Craig, I've got a question that bothers me. Mm. Um, in, in the world we live in now, there are a lot of climate deniers, mm. um, particularly in America, but certainly here in our own country. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why don't people get it? To actually embrace the idea that um, we're actually doing significant damage to our planet and we've got to make significant changes to stop that damage is really challenging for a lot of people. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of misinformation about what's required. The reality is we could make changes tomorrow. We've got the technology, we've got the expertise. Um, what's lacking is political will. Um, but when most people realise that um, you know the, the changes that are possible um, are not that difficult as long as everyone makes them. And, and that's there's a real sort of um, challenge when some people are doing uh, wonderfully well but others aren't. There's an there's a, you know, inequity of, of response. We have to all move collectively. And if we all move collectively, then we can do it. The challenge, though, is, is that we aren't moving fast enough and big things are happening in terms of our climate. We've got a whole lot of um, um, carbon dioxide that has built up w within, within the planet is overheating systems and we're seeing all around the world, whether it's floods or fires or, or heat waves, and unfortunately it is only going to get worse. Um, and so mm. part of our role collectively as citizens is to... Um, get ready for that. We've got to get organised. We've got to um, and get to know our neighbours and, 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 yes. and, and, and increase our level of caring and, and um, just um, uh, just think about it's, how we can keep just, ourselves safe. Don't be mm. depressed. Just be active. Absolutely. There's so much we can do. And it, it's very much around... I mean, humans are amazing responding to crises. And when it comes to the climate, it is such a slow-moving beast in some ways that we kind of... We, we, we don't tap into the best of ourselves. But if we do, we, we can easily respond and do amazing things and potentially change ourselves for, for the better in terms of that level of care. And actually be happier yeah. we could at the well end be. of the day. 
if we're growing our own food or... Well, if you're not worried about connecting. things, yeah. you'd be happier. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Craig, it's been great yeah. to talk to you and the wait was worth yeah. it. Thank you so much for making the time. Absolute pleasure. Because yeah, I know you're just all over the place at the moment. <laughs> and it's just great to <laughs> see your smiley face with some positive stuff <laughs> as well as good education. So thank you so much. Thanks, Malcolm. So everyone, till <laughs> next time on Our Time, <laughs> please keep yourself nice till then. Take some of that advice. Get a rainwater tank. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.